Hi. Uh, okay, this is uh, Unit 2, January 2020, IEL paper. First question, MCQ. First question, two waves of wavelength lambda from a single source diverge and then meet again. Maybe something like, uh, we can imagine it like this, maybe microwave or something like that. Maybe this is the wave source. So they are diverging like this. Then they are meeting again. The diagram is not given, I'm just drawing it. Okay, and they are meeting somewhere here. Something like this. Maybe this is the uh, point they are, they are overlapping, right? Which of the following situations would cause constructive interference? We know to cause constructive interference, the two waves should meet in phase. Yeah, they should meet in phase. So to have in phase, the path difference should be either lambda or 2 lambda, 3 lambda, integer multiple of lambda. So the correct answer is B. Correct answer B for question number 1. Okay, question number 2 is about polarization. Uh, which of the following describes the oscillations in polarized waves? So A the first answer they are saying in a single plane which is perpendicular to the direction of wave travel actually uh, when we consider polarization that's a property of the transverse wave in which the oscillation is confined to one direction such that in right angle to the direction of wave motion we can say or we can say the oscillation is confined to one plane such that the plane includes the direction of wave motion. But here the first answer says, in a single plane which is perpendicular to the direction of wave motion, no, that is wrong statement. The plane should include the direction of wave motion. So the answer A is wrong. Answer B, in many planes which include the direction of travel, no, can't be many planes. It's, uh, they need to be unpolarized, is it? So it's a wrong statement anyway. Answer C, in many directions and parallel to the direction of wave travel. So, uh, actually, uh, the meaning is not there. Any meaning is not there, right? So, leave it. So, the correct answer is D, in one direction and perpendicular to the direction of motion. It should confine to one direction and uh, it should be perpendicular to the direction of wave motion. Right. That is the question number two. Question number three, there are... Which row in the table shows the total resistance if two 5 ohm resistors? So we are given two 5 ohm resistors. If you connect them in series and parallel, what will be the uh, equivalent for? If you connect two resistors in series, each of them 5 ohms, how much will it be? The equivalent will be 10 ohms. If you connect them in parallel, two 5 ohms, if they are connected in parallel, So the equivalent 1 over r will be 1 over 5 plus 1 over 5 that r will be 2.5 ohm so the table gives four different answers so the correct answer is b 10 ohm and 2.5 ohms question number four there are a graph is given for uh, diode the graph is given like this current voltage graph is given there So the graph is given like this. Uh, so the volt, the current is zero up to certain voltage, then suddenly increases. Yeah, that's a correct one. And you know when the voltage become negative, that is reverse bias. This is forward bias. Reverse bias, the current is remaining zero. And this is marked as x. This is z. This point is marked z. And this region is marked y. So the question is, at which point or points is the resistance of this diode is infinite? So we know that R equal V over I, wherever you get current zero and there is a uh, value for V, at those points, uh, resistance is zero. So here the current is zero. So it's no current at all, even when you increase the voltage. So infinite resistance, even up to the breakdown point here, the current is zero. So the resistance is infinite. So answer X and Y, answer A. Question number four, answer 
a okay question number five these are the given data about copper wire they are giving the cross-sectional area current flow and the charge carrier density are given and four answers are given uh, and the question is which of the four answers uh, gives the drift speed so for drift speed we should use i equal na ev so i is given 0 0.93 M is given 8.4 10 to the power 28 area of cross section 5 into 10 to the power minus 7 charge of the electron that's given in the data sheet 1.6 10 to the power minus 19 and the drift speed b so make the v subject you will get 0 0.93 divided by uh, 8.4 10 to the power 28 into 1.6 10 to the power minus 19 into 5 into 10 to the power minus 7. This is the expression you will get it. So the answer, correct answer, D. Okay, question 6, uh, based on the question 6 is uh, related to photoelectric effect. When the photoelectric effect occurs, light incident on the surface of a metal release electrons. Uh, which of the following is an experimental observation of the photoelectric effect? So, first statement, electrons are only released after light has been instant for a long time. No, actually, whenever the light is exposed, instantaneously electrons will be released. Yeah? So, that is one of the failure of uh, wave theory. Is it? Uh, so, answer A is a wrong statement. Answer B, increasing the frequency of the light increases the maximum kinetic energy of the released electron so we should think about the equation hf equal 5 plus kinetic energy maximum so for a given material work function is constant when you increase the frequency uh, kinetic energy of the fastest electron will increase so uh, answer b is the correct answer but then we will check the other two statements also answer c says increasing the intensity of light increases the maximum kinetic energy okay you know that intensity is the amount of energy passing through unit area per second or amount of power passing through unit area per second for electromagnetic radiation so in photon model we can uh, give the intensity i equal n times hf where hf is the energy of the photon and n can be defined as number of photons passing through unit area per second n is the number of photons passing through unit area per second so number of photons passing through unit area per second into energy of a photon gives the intensity that is amount of energy passing through unit area per second so when you increase the intensity for a given radiation the frequency is constant so when you increase the intensity number of photons will increase that's called frequency you are keeping fixed but when you increase the intensity more number of photons will pass through unit area per second but that has no effect in kinetic energy so answer c is wrong the wrong statement not correct uh, the statement D says only light with wavelength above threshold value releases electrons. So we know that threshold frequency means the frequency, the minimum frequency required to remove an electron from the surface of metal. So any frequency of electromagnetic radiation that is greater than threshold frequency can release electron. So what is threshold wavelength? So C equal F naught lambda naught. So lambda naught equal to c over lambda uh, c over f c over f naught so the frequency is the minimum means wavelength is the maximum so any wavelength which is smaller than threshold wavelength can release any wavelength of electromagnetic radiation which is smaller than uh, threshold wavelength can release electron but here they are saying only light with a wavelength above threshold wavelength no above threshold wavelength cannot remove below threshold wavelength uh, they can remove electrons. So answer D also uh, not correct. So the correct answer is question number six B. Okay, question number seven. This uh, circuit diagram is given. A resistor and the thermistor are connected in series, and there's a ammeter voltmeter V1 across thermistor V2 across 
uh, resistor. The question is, uh, the temperature of the thermistor increases. Okay, increase temperature of the thermistor increases. We know that when the temperature increases, its resistance will decrease. Which row of the table shows how the readings on meters V1 and V2 and A and B are changes? So there are there's a table given. Uh, reading on B1, reading on B2, reading on A. So, a uh, table with three columns given. So, when the temperature increases, temperature of the thermistor increases, we know that its resistance will decrease. So, when the temperature increases, resistance of the thermistor will decrease. When the resistance of the thermistor decreases, the total resistance of the circuit will decrease. So current flow will increase. So reading of the ammeter, ammeter reading will increase. So when the ammeter reading increases, current through the resistor is increasing. There is no change in resistance, right? If I say this as R and this as RT, no change in R. But when current increases, voltage across the resistor will increase, so the reading of V2 will increase. Okay, so it's a closed circuit. So I call the Kirchhoff's second law, the EMF is equal to voltage across the thermistor V1 plus voltage across the resistor V2. But we know that V2 is increasing, EMF is not changing, so the voltage across the thermistor, that is V1, will decrease. Uh, you can't try to answer by considering this one first, because I should think about what will happen to this one. When current increases, the resistance is not changing, so the voltage across the resistor will increase. Current is increasing, res uh, resistance R is remaining unchanged. So I call V equal I R, V2 will increase. So when V2 increases, V1 will decrease. But any one of you try to answer this one first. That means resistance is decreasing. If you use V equal I R for the thermistor, V equal I times R T. Now when the resistance decreases, current flow is increasing. So resistance is decreasing, one quantity is increasing, other quantity is decreasing. When we multiply what will happen, we can't say anything. So whenever you have questions like this, serious connection of thermistor with some other component, better think about the voltage across the normal component. Its voltage will increase, therefore this voltage should decrease. So decrease, increase, increase, so answer A. The correct answer A for question number seven. Okay, question eight. Here also there are four statements. Uh, waves may be longitudinal or transverse. Which of the following statement is correct? All transverse waves travel at the same speed. No uh, different transverse waves travel at different speed. Even if you think about a transverse wave generated on a string, the speed of the transverse wave on a stretched string is given by V equal square root of T over mu. So when you change the tension, the speed will change. So answer A is not correct. Answer B, all transverse waves have vibrations that are par parallel. No, completely wrong. Is it? It's a longitudinal wave. So that statement also wrong. C, both transverse and longitudinal waves can be refracted. Yes, refraction is a general property of both longitudinal and transverse wave. The property that belongs to only for transverse wave is polarization. Yeah, reflection, refraction, diffraction, superposition is a common property for both transverse wave and longitudinal wave. Uh, answer D says no transverse wave can travel through liquids. Even a water wave is a partially a transverse wave. So correct answer question number eight c answer c is the correct one for question number eight okay question number nine uh, this diagram is not given i just drew it the question is in an experiment laser light is shown through a diffraction grating so that series of bright uh, dots uh, yeah bright dots i do it here drew it like bands doesn't matter uh, seen on a screen, the equation d sine theta equal n lambda, that's the equation for diffraction grating, uh, can be used to determine the wavelength of the laser light. So the purpose of this practical, finding the lambda, right? Which of the following is correct description of how the experiment should be performed? 
Okay, they are saying and the keta is measured using protractor. We don't measure and the keta by using protractor normally. What we do, uh, say for example, n is zero is the uh, zeroth order, n equal one are the first order on either side of the n equal zero. So to reduce the percentage uncertainty, we measure from n equal one to n equal one. We can measure this one, but to reduce the percentage uncertainty, you know, based on uh, unit three, uh, we measure from here to here and divide by 2, you will get the distance of the first order from the zeroth order. We should know the distance of the screen from the uh, diffraction rating. So we can use then tan theta equal to x by 2. That's the distance between zeroth order to first order divided by d. So we measure these two quantities so we can find the theta from this. So, we don't use a uh, protector. We calculate the theta like that. Okay, then we can substitute this here. So, D normally we can find. So, we should know the uh, number of lines per millimeter. From that, 1 over number of lines per millimeter gives the D. We can convert to meter. So, we know the D. We know the theta. If you substitute N equal 1, you can find the lambda. So, that's the practical normally we do to find the lambda. So, first part, uh, first statement, they are saying the angle theta is measured using a protractor. No, that's a wrong statement. I already explained how do we measure the theta. Second statement, the diffraction grating is set up so that it is parallel to the laser light. No, it should be perpendicular to the laser light. So, if the, if the this is if this the diffraction grating, the lines are like this, laser beam should fall like this. If you keep like this, then the laser beam will not pass through the slits. So, answer B is a wrong statement. Answer C or the statement C, the diffraction rating is set up so that it is parallel to the screen. That is right because the laser beam is kept like this. This is the laser torch. Laser beam is traveling this way. You keep the uh, diffraction rating perpendicular to the laser beam and the screen is kept parallel to the diffraction rating. Right? Then only you will see the uh, diffraction, the dots or whatever it is on the screen. So, answer C is correct. Okay, answer D, the statement D, the distance between the bright dots is measured with micrometer. No, normally, you know, one of the advantages of a diffraction grating compared to double slit, they will separate the fringes or the diffracted patterns. So, normally, we don't use a micrometer, we use normal meter rule, right? So, the correct statement for question number 9 is C, right? answer C. Question number 10. The evidence for the wave nature of electrons came from experiments involving, yes, you know when accelerated electrons pass through uh, graphite, on the other side they kept zinc sulfide screen. On the zinc sulfide screen they produce uniform circular ring pattern. So when electrons passes through the uh, graphite, uh, Due to the wave associated with the electrons, the wave associated with the electrons is called matter wave. So, this matter wave diffracted when they pass through the interatomic spacing, and when these diffracted waves overlap, they form circular ring uh, superposition pattern, right? So, which uh, what's the reason for this uh, circular ring patterns? The wave associated with the electrons diffracted. Okay, electrons are not diffracting. The wave associated with the electrons, they diffracted. That wave is called matter wave. So the evidence for the wave nature of electrons came from experiments involving answer A, diffraction. So question number 10, answer A, 